This is Peter Helland on the show Israel. <coughs> First Timothy chapter 2, verse uh, 13 is very short. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. That's verse 13. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Um, Paul is formulating his theology. That's a very important part of Paul's theology. Who wrote 12 or 13, depends on, on who you want to talk to, 12 or 13 epistles. Most of the New Testament. He forms his doctrine on that. He says, let a woman learn in silence with, all, with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. He gives the, that, that's his explanation. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. But his doctrine is formulated on, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. So I was looking, pursuing this a little bit, and I was looking for the idea of being born first, the firstborn. Christ is constantly called the firstborn. Adam, for sure, is the firstborn. Jesus is called the firstborn son all the time. And he's also called the last Adam. A lot of people, a lot of theologians call him the second Adam. It's not explicitly in the New Testament. But Christ is the Son of God. 90 times, I'm sorry, son of man 90 times, and man can be easily understood as Adam. So, common law has always brought the notion of primogeniture. That would be Latin, first geniture, first created, Genesis. So, the first son that comes out, the Old Testament says, gets a double portion. The first son is special. Christ is the first son. He has special privileges. He has uh, more responsibilities and more responsibilities, special privileges. And it took me a long time to find this book. It actually wasn't, it was at Notre Dame, but if you looked it up, it said they didn't know if they had it. They didn't know. Because it wasn't uh, put into the system. But I found the book and now they have it in the system, and it's on primogeniture, the firstborn. It's, it's, um, it's called, uh, the book is just called Primogeniture, A Short History of Its Development in Various Countries and Its, and its Practical Effects. Evan Cecil, London, 1895. But he talks about the United States. I have mentioned the United States. As might be expected, their history upon this subject is but scanty, for the states have universally rejected the English principle of primogeniture. Yet, strangely enough, an astonishing want of uniformity is displayed among them, because though each state has set up a law of its own, consonant with that of the others in general outline, some of them differ essentially in matters of detail. Okay. So he writes, we are only concerned with the steps by which eldest sons were deprived of their preeminence. And it would be as entangling as tedious to drift away into backwaters. Before the Declaration of Independence, the English law of primogeniture prevailed in several of the states. He names 10 of the 13. And it was in force in these 10 states until the Revolution. It may be considered to have received its death blow early in the Revolutionary War when Jefferson brought the whole weight of his disinterested and powerful influence to procure its abolition by the Assembly of Virginia. The previous history of entails in that state afforded a peculiar vantage ground to the assailants of primogeniture. He's explained why, how he was able to do it. Um, Jefferson, it, it is a matter of history, carried all before him. His proposals were well-timed and were victorious, and the English system melted fast away under the fiery rays of the reforming power. It can hardly be claimed to have left a trace, even in the states which continued to allow a double portion to the eldest son. So there was all kinds of aspects to primogeniture. One was 
a double portion to the other son, which the Old Testament talked about very clearly. And indeed, the Old Testament, and indeed, the Old England laws after the Declaration of Independence expressly spoke of this double portion as being according to the law of nature and the dignity of birthright. They didn't want to put it off of Scripture and ignored the possibility that it could be derived from England, which derived it from the common law, which Joseph Story, one of the preeminent Supreme Court justices, said common law has always and everywhere been founded on Christianity. Thomas Jefferson strongly disagreed, <coughs> and Jefferson was wrong. <coughs> Most people <coughs> have to admit who are not entangled in our system. But if you're already a lawyer or judge, yeah, you're going to go with that which uh, keeps you in power. Uh, at the present day, nothing of the old practice remains. Uh, he writes, the, f the feeling has grown so rapidly and the prevailing law of interstate secession has so deeply infused itself into the customary common form of a will. Um, in other words, they, they, the revolution so completely got rid of the right of the firstborn, the privileges of the firstborn son, which were which were embedded in 10 of the, of the 13 colonies. So it was a radical uh, surgery to get it out. And, and it was, it, uh, Jefferson uh, had a hard time doing it, but he succeeded. The feeling um, that 30 years ago, Mr. Beresford Hope was able to tell the House of Commons that no American dared leave his land to his eldest son, although there was no law of compulsory division. So there was no law that you, could, you couldn't give your uh, inheritance uh, a double portion to your oldest son, or you couldn't make your oldest son get the dominant. But the fervor of the revolution so conquered people that they wouldn't dare go against it. And he observed that there was only one family in the state of New York who had the boldness to disregard this popular feeling. And that was of a, a person of Dutch ascent, descent, and he had probably inherited the national obstinacy of Holland. So the significance of this is, let me just try to trace it for you. The significance is um, uh, let me get it right here. This is uh, an elaboration on uh, this book on primogeniture that I found on the internet. Well known for his deep reading and study of Virginian as well as English legal history, Jefferson was assigned the review of the application of the common law and statutory law through the founding of the colony. In other words, common law is part of all, like it's part of the law of Indiana, it's part of all the states. Common law is what ruled practically England. And as Joseph Story, the, the Supreme Court, uh, like dominated the Supreme Court in the early, early years of this country, said all common law was founded on Christianity and he said Jefferson was wrong. And Jefferson was not a jurist like uh, Joseph Story was. So, um, so he goes on and writes, uh, Jefferson was assigned the review of the application of the common law and statutory law through to the founding of the colony. Lee and Mason, having dismissed themselves on account of not being qualified, Pendleton took subsequent Virginia law and Wythe took subsequent British law. According to Jefferson's autobiography, as he had been assigned to the English origins of common law rules of dissent and the criminal law, he sought the guidance and permission of the committee to develop bills of total reform in these as well as other areas of the law. So here's now Jefferson, they claimed he's an expert, so he's going to straighten out common law. Because he argued it's not based on Christianity at all. Well, <laughs> that was so radical it wasn't funny. But this is all done in secret and this is not something people know about. Um, out of the final report submitted by the committee, which amounted to 90 pages of 126 individual bills, reforming, eliminating, and condensing previous legal material and, and even more substantial abbreviation. Jefferson later isolated four fundamental components of the re revised report that he deemed particularly important for forming a system by which every fiber would be eradicated 
of ancient or future aristocracy and a foundation laid for a government truly Republican. So the foundation he wanted to lay was to get rid of common law, which was Christianity. Not too good, not too good. These included the abolition of entail, or common law rules of descent, written to preserve the integrity of elite landed estates over time, and the similar abolition of the law of primogeniture, the freedom of religion, and the disestablishment of the Anglican Church in Virginia, the consequent outfitting of the College of William and Mary as a public university, which the chair of divinity of being converted into a chair of law and police, a seat occupied first by with, and finally the introduction of trial by jury into the chancery courts, separation of independence of which for, was further provided for in the report of the revisers of 1779. Out of these, only, only the abolition of entail and primogeniture were entirely successful, and these with great controversy and heated debate. Okay, so it was with great controversy and heated debate because this was so um, uh, integral. Uh, it was so embedded in who they were as Englishmen. They always lived under the common law, which was Christianity. And the revolution was radical. And after they succeeded in the revolution, Jefferson went right over to France to spread, to, to achieve the same thing here. Thomas Paine went over to France. Benjamin Franklin's in France to, 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 to place these ideas in France. Now France reacted to these ideas differently, differently than we did, but they were the same ideas. France openly just went to destroy Christianity. They openly went to kill the priest and remove all symbols of Christianity. We didn't react that way to the same ideas. But now we are seeing the effects. And it, it's taken a long time. Um, they, do, they say that in, in, in this here. Uh, He says, in this country, it's going to take a while. Um, it, 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 did, it, it doesn't have an effect so much in this country because we were brand new. We had unlimited land. And so getting rid of primogeniture didn't, didn't seem to have that immediate effect. But the long-range effect, that's the question. But underlining this lie, this this, this this removal of primogeniture, underlining it is the political lie. That is John Locke's um, social contract theory. And um, we'll get into that theory, but let's see, let's just discuss what have been the results of the removal of common law and placing the social contract theory girding our our judicial system. Um, for the longest time, this is probably 25 years ago, I always quoted from Dabney here out of his, art, out of his uh, essay on women's rights women, and I had it memorized, so I, I like to quote it. And I, I, I don't remember it now, as far from memory. But he predicted what would be the results of the northern interpretation of our law, of, of the Declaration of Independence, which they used um, after the Civil War. They, they, they placed the Declaration of Independence as a prism to look at our law. So all the laws have to be seen through the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, which John Henry Hopkins, the leading theologian, uh, of the Anglican Church said most everything in there is a complete lie. Okay, the idea of the king's a tyrant was even a lie. By John Adams said it was a lie. Uh, the leading minister in 1776, Witherspoon, said it was a lie. So basically the Declaration of Independence is just all lies and we have to worship that idol as if it's true. The whole legal system has to worship it like it's, like it's true. So you're talking raw idolatry, because idolatry is a lie. And so that document, Declaration of Independence, which is not law at all. So even if it was true, and it's not, it is not, it's not law. So they've taken something that's not even true, not even law, and rules in that document 
the truths they claim that are in it rule over us right now. And Dabney um, wrote his um, book right after the Civil War. Dabney was considered uh, by the uh, president of Princeton as the best theologian in the country, and he said, if not the world. And right after the Civil War, and he was Stonewall Jackson's chief of staff for six months in the thickest, thickest of the battles. But he writes the book after the war, Defense of Virginia and Where Virginia Was Coming From, what their doctrine was. And um, he said this doctrine would undermine the husband-wife relationship. He said that. And then in, in Women's Rights Women, um, 73, he wrote this in 66, he, uh, he, he goes at the theme. And he says, with this doctrine that is going by the social contract theory, and that theory said that man was created totally independent. And I'll, and I'll get into that, but here's the results of following that theory that, that Dabney predicted. And he, and he first of all says, um, Women's rights means the abolition of all permanent married marriage ties. And I'm going to jump here a little bit. Um, some hoodwinked advocates of Katie Stanton represented these women's rights. Of her revolution may be blind to the sequence, but it is inevitable. It must follow by this cause, if for no other, that the unsexed, politicating woman can never inspire in man that true affection on which marriage should be founded. Men will doubtless be still sensual, but it is simply impossible that they can desire them for the pure and sacred sphere of the wife. Let every woman ask herself, will she choose for the lord of her affections an unsexed, effeminate man? No more can man be drawn to the masculine woman. Now, you know, we got, don't forget, we got Brittany Briner in our heads right now. The mutual attraction of the two complementary halves is gone forever. The abolition of marriage would follow again by another cause. The divergent interest and the rival independence of the two equal wills would be irreconcilable with domestic government or union or peace. Now let me just jump in. Uh, at church, uh, not this last Sunday, but the Sunday before. Um, no, this last Sunday. The lady, uh, today is Wednesday, so yeah, last Sunday, in the Sunday school class, the lady spoke up and said that her nephew, I, I believe it was, you know, I might have one little thing wrong, but the idea is that her nephew was in the military, or the army, and he was with a company of 80 men, his company had 80 men, and the nephew told her that he was the only one that grew up with two parents, that had, from a two-parent household, and I assume that meant the only one that made it till he went into the service that he had two parents all the way through. And everybody else, it collapsed. It collapsed. And then I, I went up to one of the fellows in the church, and I go, is that what she said? I know I heard her say that, but I just wanted to confirm it. He said, he said no, no, she said 80. I thought, well, was it eight? He said, no, 80. He said, she, she said, that her nephew said, all, all 80 in the company, he was the only one that came from a two-parent household. Now, what caused this fundamentally? I mean, there's many causes, but what's the fundamental principle that's driving this American experiment that has led to that? Well, Dabney talked about it right after the war. He talked about it uh, eight years after the war. Um, and then, on top of that, I'm talking to a guy who's a, um, one of the most successful coaches in this area. And he doesn't get too many awards, but he's one of the most successful. And um, he's about 76. And um, so we're talking about, he's talking about how he's raising his son, and his son was performing like really good, really good. But then he had a problem with his marriage, and so there was a divorce or a separation. So now the son is with the mother, and... Now he's quitting everything, you know, because, you know, the mother's different than the father. You know, she's allowing him to quit, you know, she's soft, and he's raising him like, like he's a coach, you know. And 
he basically went by the biblical principle, children are to fear their parents. And Jesus said twice, any, parent, any child that curses his parents is to be put to death. Well, he walked in that, okay? He knew to be successful as a coach, you had to be that way. You had to keep those kids on edge or they're not going to perform. He just knew that. And, and then I, I, I affirmed him in that. I said, yeah, you're right. And I said, not, I said, not only on that, I'll beat you. I'll do one better. The Bible says the wife is to fear her husband. If you don't have your wife in the proper relationship, how are you going to get the kids in the proper relationship? And if you had your wife in the right relationship, you wouldn't have lost your child. And you know, of course, that's a tougher one to handle because how many men have their wife in check, biblically, like they're supposed to? Oh, we can't go there, okay? Well, let's understand why we can't go there, okay? You can't go there legally, for sure, and you can't go there psychologically, for sure. That's why they got rid of, rid of primo, primogeniture, and there wasn't any law to get rid of it. I mean, if you wanted to honor your, uh, give, give double inheritance to your son or, or your first son, you could do it, but, but people didn't dare do it because psychologically, America had been conquered by this radical notion of equality already. And it goes back to Adam was born first and then Eve. If you're the oldest son, you're the oldest son. And you automatically, from God, get special privileges, special duties, but, and special privileges. We got rid of it. That was Thomas Jefferson working furiously behind the scenes to get rid of that. He wanted to get rid of almost all of it, which probably got, was gotten rid of by Lincoln after the Civil War. So what Jefferson accomplished in 1776, Lincoln finished it off. So common law is on the books, like in Indiana, but we're not going by it. Common law is Christianity. We're not going by it. Because Christianity would be what St. Paul said. He says, I write these things to you that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. These epistles are telling us how your home ought to be, ought to be uh, how the husband ought to govern his home. And there's a famous uh, historian, one of the most famous, Gordon S. Wood, who's talking about how it was after the Revolution. Well, they were having a hard time because up to the Revolution, they went by, oh, and my friend who is the co uh, very successful coach, he said, that's why I don't go to church. Because they won't preach this. They're supposed to preach it, but they won't. Yeah. He knows that's the only way to run a home. Those children better fear the parents. The wife better fear the husband. We're talking godly fear. We're not talking the, there's a negative fear, and then there's a biblical fear. The children have to have a biblical fear. Don't forget, wisdom is the fear of God. So if you're walking in the fear of God, how does a child do it? She fears her, they fear the parents. If a woman's walking in the fear of God, she fears her husband with the fear of God. The American Revolution wiped that out. That's what Gordon S. Wood said, wiped it out. They, we got rid of the word fear because they found a scripture verse somewhere that says, well, perfect love casts out all fear. I mean, they, 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 they twist scripture to get what they want. And my, my friend, who's the coach, said, that's why I don't go to church, because they won't preach it. And they're afraid to preach it. That's why I had the last show. Yeah, they're afraid for the woman to put the head covering on. Because that symbolizes they are to be in submission to the men. As we are in submission, the man is in submission to Christ, and we must fear Christ. The woman must be in submission to her husband and fear her husband. We hate that. That was gotten rid of. And Jefferson fought furiously to, to, to assist in getting rid of it. But then Dabney said, well, here's the consequence of that. Here's the consequence. He said, the abolition of marriage would follow again by another cause. The divergent interest and the rival independence of the two equal wills would be irreconcilable with domestic government or union or peace. And we talked about um, beauty deceiving the man. So he marries the wrong woman because he's just marrying, he's trying to marry, he's marrying out of lust. Um, and just today, I'm talking to a fella, he's my age, um, and he admitted, yeah, he, he married 30 years and then they divorced. And I said, well, I said, what happened? 
I said, was she, was she pretty? Oh, marvelously pretty. Okay. And um, so I said, so did you marry her for her beauty? And he kind of goes, yeah. Or her eyes, you know, oh, yeah. Well, was that, so that the beauty on the outward wasn't reflective of the inward, was it? No. So you, did you get deceived? He said, hey, I got deceived. Well, this is what usually happens. And the men are not looking. Charm is deceitful, beauty is fleeting, but the woman who fears the Lord. They're always making the wrong choice. Okay, almost always. Okay, so uh, shall the children of this monstrous no union be held responsible to two variant coordinate and supreme wills at once? Heaven pity the children. This is Dabney. Heaven pity the children. Shall the two parties to this perpetual co-partnership have neither the power to secure the performance of the mutual duties nor to dissolve it? It is a self-contradiction and an impossible absurdity. What somebody just told me yesterday, 60% are divorcing now. <clears throat> well, no wonder nobody wants to get married. It's too dangerous. They don't have a clue. Nobody has a clue what they're doing. How many voters have a clue what they're doing when they vote? Everybody knows they don't. You think the average person trusts the other person that's voting? They know they don't know what they're doing when they vote. And they know their neighbor doesn't know what they're doing. They just vote. They don't have a clue what they're doing. What kind of system is that? And then I was talking to somebody about how people get on welfare and they're cheating. And they said, well, what percentage, what percentage do you think people cheat that get, get welfare of any kind, that lie? You know, they leave out something, they exaggerate to, you know, to get more money. In any program that's out there. Well, pretty much, he agreed, probably 99%. Well, that's fantastic, isn't it? So 99% of the people are cheating. No, hopefully it's a lot lower. But when you look around, who's not cheating a little bit? All you, all you got, you know, who's going to challenge you on it? Just fudge a little bit, just exaggerate here, you know, do, you know, don't tell the full truth here. This is the experiment in self-government. How are people self-governing? Well, they're lying and cheating all the time. Wow. That's not good self-government. Um, such a co-partnership of equals with independent interests must be inseparable at will as all other such co-partnerships are. The only relationship between the sexes will, which will remain will be a co cohabitation continuing so long as the convenience or caprice of both parties may suggest, and this with most will amount to a vagrant concubinage. Okay, now here's the part I had memorized. I said it 25, I don't know how many years ago, a long time ago. I used to say it all the time because it's so pertinent. So, you, so it's good to always read it and always reflect on it because Dabney was so prophetic, and he was prophetic not by some mystical revelation that God gave him, but by, but by just hardcore logic. Hardcore logic. So he writes, but now what will be the character of the children reared under such a domestic organization as this? <clears throat> now, I'll get back to that. But where, what created this domestic organization where the husband and wife are now equal? Well, that was the Northern. That was the Northerners. They come up with it. The Southerners were fighting it. In fact, you still see remnants. When I go down, I just got back from St. Louis. Amtrak, I came back on the Amtrak, and I saw it all the time. I didn't see it this time, but I saw it all the time, where you'd see the daughter leaning on the, on the father. You just go down there, and there'd be a daughter leaning on her dad's shoulder. I mean, like, really tight. Yeah, that's Southern. That's Southern. Not in the North. You very seldom see that in the North. You saw it frequently in the South. wonder why. <clears throat> yeah, because that's the Bible Belt, and we're not. Okay? They're going to have a better father-daughter relationship. Um, in fact, let me just point out in the Scripture um, the effect of the father not watching over the daughter. Okay. Um, the effect. Dabney will get into that quote that I have, and this, this will flush it out even more. 
This is the this is uh, Book of Sirach, chapter 42, the duty of a father to his daughter. A daughter is a secret anxiety to her father, and worry over her robs him of sleep. When she is young, for fear she may be mar she may not marry, or if married, for fear she may be disliked. While a virgin, for fear she may be seduced and become pregnant in her father's house, or having a husband, for fear she may go astray, or married, or though married, for fear she may be barren. Keep strict watch over a headstrong daughter. Okay, this is a, this is a duty of a father. This is one of his highest duties. If left unfulfilled, he is a total disaster. He is, he has he has failed completely if he doesn't do this. That's why. A daughter is a secret anxiety to her father because he's aware of what his duty to her is and it, and it scares him. Keep strict watch over a headstrong daughter and she, or she may make you a laughing stock to your enemies, a byword in the city and the assembly of the people and put you to shame in public gatherings. See that there is no lattice in her room, no spot that overlooks the approaches to the house. And here's the verse I like. Do not let her parade her beauty before any man or spend her time among married women. For from garments come the moth, and from a woman comes woman's wickedness. Better is the wickedness of a man than a, than a woman who does good. It is woman who brings shame and disgrace. Now you could say, well, that shouldn't be. I mean, this is Book of Sirach. The Orthodox, the Catholic, considered inspired. Some people say, well, that's too harsh. Well, okay. It says here, do not let her parade her beauty before any man. The last show was, on, was called Beauty in the Old Order um, Mennonite worship. But you connect that with Leviticus 19, which says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You shall fear your mother and your father, and you shall keep my Sabbath. I am the Lord your God. You shall fear your fa father and your mother. It says here, do not profane your daughter by making her a prostitute, that the land not become prostituted and full of depravity. Okay. Do not profane your daughter by making her a prostitute. Do not let her parade her beauty before any man. They're very similar. If you're parading her beauty before other men, in a way you're prostitu you're, you are prostituting her. You're pimping her. But you don't think so. But your great-great-grandmother did. So who's right, you or your great-great-grandmother? Or maybe it's your great-grandmother. Yeah, they know, they know by you parading her beauty before other men, you are prostituting her. But we do it all day long without one reflection. Is that, is that, is that the way to protect your daughter? And how many daughters that these men are, that have a duty to protect our virgins, when he takes her down the altar, if he even does, when he takes her down to the altar, what percentage had been protected? 5%. So 95%, the wolf has come in and mauled on that girl because of the father. Because of the father. Because had he made any effort, he could have protected her. He didn't want to. Too afraid to. What a disaster. So... If the daughter's not protected, I guess you're going to have bastard children. And if the daughter's not protected, I guess you're going to have 80 men in a company of men in the military, and only one will come from a home with two parents. What a beauty. Now, why are the fathers having a hard time? Well, they're up against a system that makes it very hard for them to do their duty. Okay, that's why my, my friend would not, doesn't want to go to church, because they won't preach this. They're not, they're not supporting the father, they're not actually really supporting the father in the home so he can get his job done. Yeah, that's true. The government's against him, and the church is not really for him either. So where does the guy go? So here is uh, the quote I had memorized. But now, what will be the character of the children reared under such a domestic organization as this? If human experience has established anything at all, it is the truth that of that principle announced by the Hebrew prophet when he declared that the great aim of God in ordaining a permanent marriage tie between one man and one woman was, quote, that he might seek a godly seed. That's in Malachi 2.15. Okay, so he's saying here what was the aim of God 
what God's aiming at in marriage is a godly seed. The purpose of marriage is for those parents to raise up godly children. And that's going to require great diligence. Teaching them all the time, and you better be teaching them personally. Oh, I sent them to church. I sent them to Christian school. Sorry. <laughs> you know, <laughs> God's going to hold you accountable on that one. If, you, if you're going to get married, you better be ready for marriage. And that means you better be ready to you teach those kids the Word of God, inside and outside, all the time. Okay, that's the goal of marriage, to seek a godly seed, and it'll happen when the Word of God goes into your children. And it's ordained that the parents put the Word of God, and especially the father, puts the Word of God in their children. How else are they going to become godly? Godly means obedience to the Word. Dabney goes on, God's ordinance, the only effective human ordinance for checking and curbing the first tendencies to evil is domestic parental government. The schools can't do it. They can't stop the evil in those kids. They're born with unbelievable, wicked, original sin. Calvin calls it total depravity. Other churches, other denominations, other churches say, well, it's not total depravity, but it's pretty bad. Okay. Hmm. Pretty bad. They're born, they're born fairly wicked, okay? They're born with foolishness galore, and you better drive it out of them. That's what it says. And basically only the parents can really do it, okay? I just had a meeting of men, older men, and the one guy was just saying, if, there, uh, if there's not a father in the home, forget it. Just forget it. Other men go, well, oh, that's not fair. He, he stuck to his guns, okay? He stuck to his guns. Uh, he writes, when the family shall no longer have a head, when the family shall no longer have a father, and the great foundation for the subordination of children in the mother's example is gone. How do you create godly children? Mainly, the mother's example of godliness is what they imprint onto. Every word she says, every, everything she's doing, they imprint to it. They become the mom. Now, the daughter, the Bible for sure, the mother like, mother like daughter, but the sons become like the mom. They imprint on their mommy. And if she manifests any contentiousness, any rebellion, Instead of producing godly children, you're producing little rebels. Well, they don't, they don't want to preach this, do they? Well, it is the truth, but, but maybe some people will leave the church. Okay. Um, when the family should no longer have a head and the great foundation for the subordination of children in the mother's example is gone, when the mother shall have found another sphere than her home for her energies, when she shall have exchanged the sweet charities of domestic love and sympathy for the fierce passions of the hustings. Okay. Under Catholic doctrine, under the Council of Trent, it would be nice if I had the quote here, but uh, they have a nice big section under uh, Council of Trent, Catholic doctrine, 15th century, I believe, says, and they quote one scripture after another, and they say, the scripture says the woman is to be a keeper at home, and that's true, she must be a keeper at home, and she can only leave the home with her husband's permission. That was in Catholic doctrine, 1500. And they tended to be a little looser than some of the other denominations. Where are we at with that one? Where are we at? Okay, when the mother shall have found another sphere than her home for her energies, when she shall have exchanged the sweet charities of domestic love and sympathy, for the fierce passions of the hustings, the marketplace, when families shall be disrupted at the caprice of either party, and the children scattered as foundlings from their hearthstone, it requires no wisdom to see that a race of sons will be reared nearer akin to devils than to men. In the hands of such a bastard progeny, without discipline, without homes, without a god, the last remains of social order will speedily perish, and society will be overwhelmed in savage anarchy. And then he goes on at the end. He says, um, As the dull and pestilential waves of the Dead Sea have been to every subsequent age the memento of the sin of Sodom, which where we're at. So the, when I said this, when I read this 25 years ago, oh, Sodom was far away. Sodomy was still far away. Where is it now? So, so, as the waves of the Dead Sea have been to, as a memento of the sin of Sodom, the Dead Sea, 
where Sodom and Gomorrah is, so the dreary, tri so the dreary tides of anarchy and barbarism, which will overwhelm the boastful devi devices of infidel democracy, which comes from John Locke, will be the caution of all future legislators. And thus women's rights will assist America to fulfill her great mission, that of being the scarecrow of the nations. Now let's, let's get to the, the fundamental lie here, and, and time goes fast. Okay, so the fundamental lie is John Locke's uh, notion of a social contract. He argues, instead, when a human being is, is in the mother's womb, and I was just hearing several women talk about when you have a child in the womb, you need to start disciplining it right then. Now, I'm not a woman, I don't, I, I'm not going to carry a child, I don't know where, I, I, you know, like, where are you coming from? Well, they know. I've heard several women say, yeah, when you have that woman, woman, the child in the womb, you need to start disciplining it right then. But Locke's idea is, when a child comes out of the womb, that child's independent. Nobody has authority of that child. The parents don't even have authority. That child is independent. Yeah. What did the devil say? You shall be as gods. In fact, God said, and then God said, they have become as gods. Of course that kid thinks he's God. Once he gets the chance to think that when he gets two, about two, the, the terrible twos, if the parents don't remind him, no, you're not God, I'm your authority and you must obey me. No, John Locke's idea is, oh no, that's not how it works at all. That's not how it works. Well, here, here's Dabney. Um, let me, if he can... Um, he says, the true origin of this theory, okay, okay, he writes, the popular theory of man's natural rights, of the origin of governments, and of the moral obligation of allegiance, is that which traces them to a social contract. And don't forget, this is the book that I spent a lot of money for. John Fletcher uh, argued that the patriots were crazy. They were nuts. Their argument was that when Adam died, he, didn't, he never appointed a successor. There was no will, I guess. And so and then all of a sudden, everybody's equal. There was nobody in charge. He says nobody would ever preach that from the pulpit. But that's what the patriot theologians, that's what they were going with. And now we're going with, you know, they upped the ante, and now we're going with, uh, well, it's similar. It's the social contract. And Dabney points out the social contract is a total lie. Totally. It never happened. Nobody could ever prove even slightly it ever happened. They just bought it. They just bought it. It enabled the revolution. Yeah. You need lies to pull a revolution off because God is against rebellion. So if God's against rebellion, how are you going to join a, a, a rebellion? Well, you've got to come up with false prophets, okay, telling lies. And the social contract theory, which upon which our legal system fundamentally rests, is a total lie. Now, where are we, how's that lie assisting us? We're, we're seeing the results. The true origin of this theory may be found with Hobbes, okay. Uh, Hobbes or Marsbury. It owes its respectability among Englishmen chiefly to the pious John Locke, a sort of baptized image of that atheistic philosopher, Hobbes. And it was ardently held by the infidel Democrats of the first French Revolution. According to this scheme, each person is by nature an independent integer, wholly sujuris, absolutely equal to every other man, and naturally entitled as a lord of creation to exercise his whole will. So when Paul says Adam was born first and then Eve, and he founds his whole theology on this, that the firstborn is given special rights, primogeniture. Now, if you're the firstborn son and you got all your brothers after you and they don't believe in it, they're going to revolt against you. They're going to try to take you out, which is what we got here. We got chaos and families are being destroyed as fast as they're made. But families used to last a long time. It was called patriarchy. Families used to last a long time. People stayed in the same area. I was at a uh, Christmas uh, party last night talking to a fella. Grandparents came from the Netherlands. They had 13 kids. They lived by, up by South Haven. And we were talking about people leaving their, you know, where they were raised and where they leave. Families are scattered to the winds. 
He said 11 out of the 13, because he knew personally, 11 out of the 13, those kids stayed right there. Yeah, that was normal. They stayed right there. Are the family staying? What's happening to the family? The family's being totally wiped out. No one wants to notice. Um, according to this scheme, each person is by nature an independent integer, wholly so jurist, absolutely equal to every other man, and naturally entitled, entitled as a lord of creation to exercise his whole will. Man's natural liberty was accordingly defined as privileged to do whatever he wished. Yeah, it sounds like the devil. Do thou as thou may. Do thou as thou wilt. True, Locke attempts to limit this monstrous pop postulate by, by defining man's native liberty as privileged to do whatever he wished within the limits of the law of nature. But this virtually returns to the same because he teaches that man is by nature absolutely independent so that he must be himself the supreme original judge what this law of nature is. Yeah, because nobody, can, nobody agrees on what the natural law is, law of nature. No, it's all subjective now. According to the doctrine of the social contract, man's natural rights are confounded with this so-called natural liberty. Then he goes on. Then he said, claims, you know, Blackstone, or, oh, Blackstone, he upholds the common law. Blackstone's great. Well, Dabney doesn't, Dabney says, nah, Blackstone was a follower of John Locke. Some liberal writers, as Blackstone, people think he's conservative. Dabney says he's liberal. Some liberal writers, as Blackstone, are too sensible not to see that this scheme is false to the facts of the case. But they still hold that although individual men never, in fact, existed in the independent insulation supposed, and did not actually pass into a state of society by a formal social contract, yet such a transaction must be assumed as the implied and virtual source of political power and civic obligation. There it is. The source of political power and civic, civic obligation is based on a fantasy fiction that men are born, ye shall be as gods, but they're born totally as a god. But since it would, be, it would be bad to have all these gods just fighting with each other, it's similar to Fletcher saying after Adam died, nobody took charge. It's the same scenario. And so they have to, they have to come to an agreement and people say, okay, I consent to give up some of my rights in order to have a functioning government. But I'm the source of authority. And that was the whole argument that authority comes from the people. It's based on John Locke. Authority comes from the people. So in the first time in the history of the world, a lawyer told me this, in the history of the world, we were the first country not to acknowledge God. All, every state acknowledges God but not the federal constitution, which Lincoln put over everybody. It says, we the people. This comes from John Locke. This comes from his social contract myth and, and, and fiction that even Blackstone went along with. And Blackstone's supposed to be this conservative, oh, he, he's, up, he's upholding Christianity. Is he? If he goes with his fiction, he's, he's wiping out Adam and Eve. He's wiping out the whole foundation. And he's still, he's still Christian? That's, that's a good one. Uh, to us, it appears that, that if the contracting never occurred in fact, but is only a theoretical fiction, it is no basis for anything and no source of practical rights and duties. Yet they made this, this is the source of all your rights and duties. Women's rights, everybody's rights, it's based on this lie. Well, how long is, it, how long is, is a society going to last when it's founded on a total lie? It's kind of like the Bitcoin, that, that little, that kid, 30-year-old kid, whose parents are profess law professors at Stanford, you know, who's the great three? Stanford, Yale, and Harvard. Whose parents are law professors, and the dad, he's also a big shot in psychology on top of it, okay? And his girlfriend, her two parents are professors at MIT. Probably the big four, Stanford, Harvard, Yale, MIT. Those are the big four, aren't they? And these guys are calling all the shots. They created a fictitious money scheme. They pulled it off. These are the people running the ship. These professors at the universities, these law professors at these universities with huge big PhDs in psychology steering them, they're creating, this, they're creating these monsters. They're creating these monstrous uh, Ponzi schemes. 
What else would they do with their time? Um, we object then, um, let me see, it's no source of practical rights and duties. Civil society is a universal fact and its existence must be grounded in something actual. We object then to this dream of a social contract preceded by a native state of individual independence that it is false to the facts of the case. Human beings never rightfully existed for one moment in this state out of which they are supposed to have passed by their own option. God never gave them such independency. The responsibility to him and to the civil society under which he has placed them is as native as they are being ordained by God to exist from the first. And it even gets better and better as he writes. And he can't, he can't go there. But he says here, second, we object that it is atheistic, utterly ignoring the existence of a creator. Of course, this is the foundation of our Constitution and our law. That's why the Constitution doesn't, doesn't acknowledge God. First time in the history of the world, uh, my lawyer friend who studied it, we are the first one that doesn't acknowledge. We acknowledge we the people. That's it. Yeah. We trace civil government then not to any social contract or other human expediency, but to the will and providence of God and to original moral obligation. But let's get right to um, this part. But other consequences follow from the abolitionist dogmas. See, this is how they got rid of slavery based on this. Not from the Bible, but from the Declaration of Independence and John Locke's uh, social contract theory. But it doesn't just end with the abolition of slavery. On the paper, yeah, it's great to, not to have to have slavery. But it would also be great not to have prisons. It'd be great to ha not to have a lot of stuff. It'd be great that you don't have, to don't have to put the rod on your child. But what happens if you do have to put the rod on your child? Oh, no, that'll never happen. You'll never have to. Really? Men are, men are born angels now? Hmm. Okay. But other consequences follow from the abolitionist dogmas. We're explaining why everything's falling apart. Uh, and this was being screamed all the time. There's no excuse. This was being screamed in 1776 by Fletcher. This is being screamed by Dabney in the 70s. And it was not just them, all, tons of people. Nobody wanted to hear it. Nobody wants to hear it. Because you'll have no excuse on Judgment Day. You go, well, I never heard that. No, it was screamed at you. Well, I don't remember. Well, it was. All involuntary restraint is a sin against natural rights. Therefore, laws which give to husbands more power over the persons and property of wives than to wives over husbands are uniquitous and should be abolished. Huh. He wrote this right after the Civil War. He knew where, he knew where this was going. It didn't happen overnight. They tried to get it happening overnight. But you are God. The serpent says, you shall be as God. And God said, they have become as one of us. Yeah, and that's why you need government, because people do think they're gods. And you need government, and you need parents to knock that out of them. And if you don't knock it out of them, you're going to have like that 10-year-old kid in Wisconsin. He wanted those uh, uh, headphones, 3D headphones. His mom wouldn't give it to him. He went and got the gun at 10 years old and shot her right in the face and killed her. Raised by a mom and grandmother. Um, any, all involuntary restraint. You can't tell me what to do. Yeah, that's our law. The wife doesn't believe her husband's her boss. No way. You aren't my boss. Where does she get that? John Locke, social contract theory. Like she gets that from our, the foundation of our political system. And then you add evolution to it, it's, it they're off and running. You aren't, you're not going to stop this freight train. All involuntary restraint is a sin against natural rights. Wow. The same... Um, Husband has no more power of his wife than the wife over, over her. That's already, that's already the law. That's, that's already happening in most marriages. Uh, the same decision must be made upon the exclusion of women, whether married or single, from suffrage, office, and the full franchises of men. He writes this right after the Civil War. There must be an end of the wife's obedience to her husband. Is it said that these subordinations are consistent because women assent to them voluntarily in consenting to become wives? He blows that away. He said, that's, that ain't gonna, that's not going to hold, and he gave, gives the reason why. But when God's ordinance of the family is thus uprooted and all the appointed influences of education thus inverted, 
when America has had a generation of women who were politicians instead of mothers, how fundamental must be the destruction of society and how distant and difficult must be the remedy? 1866. Uh, he was only the chief of staff for Stonewall Jackson. He was only considered the best uh, by the president of Princeton, the leading seminary, the best theologian in the country, if not the world. And of course, we're all listening to this, right? Everybody knows about Dabney. No, nobody knows about Dabney. Nobody has ever known about Dabney. They buried him. Um, well, how are we going to correct this? You correct it by getting the church strong enough and start preaching the truth and making sure that the family is being governed the way God says it should be governed, not the way our political system says it should be governed. And right now, we're yielding to what the political legal system says, this is how you ought to govern your home. Totally contrary to the way God says. That's why my friend says, I, I, I ain't going to, I, that's why I don't go to a church, because they won't preach this. I had a chance to make my son great, but my wife took over control and turned him into a, an effeminate something, whatever. Destroyed him, he thinks. Has that ever happened before? Does a woman know how to make a soldier out of, out of her boy? No. She doesn't have the instinct for it. The dad knows how to make him a soldier, and we're called to be soldiers of Christ. Is that what we got going on? Is that what they're producing? Are they producing soldiers out there? Or what are they producing? Dabney said, uh, it's a disaster. It will be a disaster. He predicted it. So, that, that is the lie. This is the social contract theory by John Locke. It's similar to, ye shall be as gods. And God said, they have become as one of us. And people think they are independent and nobody can tell them what to do. Because I know my rights. Well, can't God tell you what to do? Can't your father tell you what to do? Can't the husband tell the wife what to do? Oh, no. Wow, how's America doing on that? How's it going? So, this is Peter Allen. Thank you.